All right, so uh, this discussion section is the rest of it will be for the semester. are going to be focused on very practical things. Um, and in particular, how you can become a better C programmer and uh, operate smoothly in a Unix environment. And we're really going to be giving you a lot of uh, material that's going to help uh, you do the projects better. So one, one thing that is kind of a little bit odd on the schedule is that they gave us uh, an hour and 15 minutes for our discussion and the other one 50 minutes. So even though we have this room for that time, usually this discussion section will just be a 50 minute uh, session on like lectures. So for those of you who have uh, visited the website yet, <clears throat> how many of you have gotten a chance to start P1? Well, that's a, that's a fairly decent number. So um, have you guys just done like part A? Who's, who started on part A yet? And then part B? Okay, so it looks like a lot of people have started on part A. Um, so, and which is good. So like that's the easier part. Um, I may be spending most of today talking about part B. So here's, here's the both parts. And I, I talked about this yesterday in lecture, but just remember that if you have any questions, the fastest way to get help is this email address right here. Uh, I'm, I'm sure like all the TAs and myself and other instructor are uh, sleeping on different schedules, so you might get some responses at even an odd hour of the night uh, if you email this. Whereas if you say just email me, maybe I might be sleeping or something when you are trying to ask a question. Um, the other thing nice about this list is that you should uh, send us your code if you are asking uh, why your program doesn't work. Um, I think you'll be surprised how, how much we'll actually be willing to sit down and like help you debug your programs. But the one thing I would ask is that that's not your first, uh, your first approach to solving the problem when you run into something. Uh, you need to like spend some time on it yourself and when you give it to us you have to say what you've tried uh, and wh what output you see and what you expected to see. And then it'll, from there, if, if you spend some serious time on it, and then it'll be an interesting problem, and we can have some fun trying to debug it together. So, um, so yeah, so send any questions there. Uh, there's some general notes here. Uh, we put a tutorial on C here, and hopefully most of this is um, stuff you guys are already familiar with, but I would still just recommend skimming this, so that at, at the very least you can know what holes there are in your knowledge. Uh, also, I had recommended the Kernighan and Ritchie book, which I'm recommending again here. Uh, you could just sit down and read it in a sitting or two, or uh, there's a lot of, um, if you just want to know a particular thing, say you want to use, uh, know, know how to do have pointer arrays. Like I, we have like the specific sections in there if there's something you feel like you need to understand. Uh, for project partners, uh, you have to do this first one on your own. Uh, just to get up to speed and make sure that you have a, a basic understanding of how to program in C and in the kernel. And then after that, you'll be able to have project partners. Handing in a simple, we'll just create some directories for you, a directory for each, uh, each person, and you can just copy your code there. And so now let's look at part one. So this is just, uh, so who's familiar, who has heard of the birthday paradox before? Basically, the idea is if you get a small set of people in a room, say just 23, there's a 50% chance that uh, there will be at least two people with the same birthday. So uh, it's a paradox because most people think you would need more. Uh, the, this is just a simple assignment. Basically, what you have to do is you have to say for a given number of people, what is the probability that you're going to have a collision between people? Um, and, and you're just going to do that via simulation to estimate. So I'm not going to talk about this a lot because it's pretty straightforward, but you should ask any questions if you have them. Uh, but there is some general advice that applies somewhat to this project and to the rest in general. Um, in particular, you should be keeping old versions of your code around. Um, one of the worst experiences I have when I'm programming is uh, when I get, finally get something working and then I make a bunch more changes and then it stops working. So I figure, okay, well, I'll just change it back the way it was and then it still doesn't work and I can't remember um, how it was working before. So kind of the um, poor man's uh, approach to keeping around versions is that you could just keep renaming your files. You could say uh, paradox.b1, paradox.v2, and so on. Uh, has anybody used anything more sophisticated than this? Yeah, so a fair number of people. So, so, so what, what do people use for, uh, so people will manage these things in uh, repos. Uh, so who has used, say, git before for repo management? And what about SVN? Okay, so a lot of the same people have used both. So I'm just going to, um, this will probably be boring to those of you who have used it before, but I'm just going to show you a tool I use for Git, just, uh, and then you might want to use this yourself. 
So uh, for Glenn and SVN, there's all these different web services that will help you track your changes online and integrate with the tool. And uh, you can use these so you don't have to set up the repo yourself. And then there's also um, a lot of nice tools with these. So I think uh, um, GitHub is a popular one. Um, I've been using Bitbucket a lot lately. And so I'm going to click on this. So this is a research project I've been doing with a couple other uh, grad students in the Linux kernel. So we can browse all the source right on, on the website here. And what's really nice is if, if we're, we want to see like who's doing all the work and who's slacking, we can look at commits and see what people have done. And uh, unfortunately, you can kind of see here I've been uh, slacking lately on this project. Um, but I'm just going to show you quick how uh, we can, uh, how this interacts with the local um, thing. So, so if, if, if you set up something like this, you can like check out your code, and they have tutorials for that on Bitbucket. And I have all my code checked out here. And so I can just run some commands like, say, get status. And this will tell me uh, what, uh, um, what files have changed since the last time, since the last major milestone or commit. So this is kind of running slow here. But let me uh, just run git log. Git log, it shows all the recent changes. And let me try running this again. It's, it's kind of slow because this is on top of AFS. And uh, I guess as you'll learn later in this semester, AFS, not all the files are right where I'm necessarily running commands. They might be on another machine, so it's chopping them over the network right now. Um, but this will just take a moment to complete. So well, well that's, that's running. It's just... Normally shouldn't take that long. Uh, let me just show you some examples of some commits. So for instance, I could, I could look at this one here, uh, fixed a few bugs, and I could see what happened here. Well, everything is running slow. So I can see what files have changed. So it looks like uh, she was adding uh, new build flags um, and then adding some different things. So you can just see. So like in the red, that's what's been deleted, and then the green is what's replaced that. And let me see if this other... Okay, so this is done now. So when I run get status, it shows that nothing is dirty. So I'm going to change a file. I'm just going to change the readme since that's pretty innocuous. And I'm just going to make a small, um, uh, a small change and save that. And then if I run get status again, I can see exactly which files have changed. And if I run another command like get diff, it'll show me all those changes. So this first line is a minus, so it's saying this has been deleted from the file, and this is a plus. So now let's say I want to share um, this new informative readme with my partners. Uh, what I would do is I would first commit it, and I can have a message with that. So I'll just say new uh, readme, and then dash A, I can say like, I'm going to make a commit with all the files I've changed. So I'll do that. And now if I run git log, um, you can see that I have this here, but it's not actually out on the website yet. If I want to share this with other people, then at that point I would have to run uh, git push. And okay, and then I could go back to the website and see that there's a new uh, a new commit here. So if you want to use this tool, you'll probably have to read a lot of tutorials on your own. But as you're working with project partners, I would highly recommend it. And it's also pretty useful even if you're just working um, by yourself. So one thing I would note, though, is that some of these online services, say GitHub, they, just make, uh, they might make your code public by default. So make sure they aren't doing that, because then people could easily cheat off of you. Um, so let me show you another thing that will be useful for sharing. So let's say as you're working with a partner, you might want to have a, a directory where uh, both they can access it and you can access it with your code. So let me just, uh, I'm in my home directory right now on a CSL machine. And I could say go into the public directory. And if I want to see who can access this, I just run the fs command. And then I could say list ACL. ACL is access control list and dot. And then I see that, OK, the administrators can do a lot of things. They have a lot of letters here. Um, I don't even know what all those letters are. Uh, it's uh, read, uh, list files in a directory, 
write, and then I think those are the important ones. And then you see that any user can read the code in this directory. So this would be a bad place for me um, to do my homework or my projects. Um, instead, if I go up to private and I run that again, uh, you see that uh, only the administrators, myself, and then this other thing uh, that I've created can actually read in this directory. So this would be useful. And then if you want to add other people, you can run uh, this uh, set ACL command, and then uh, you could sh specify a user and what permissions they have in your directories, and you can collaborate that way. So, so any questions so far? This is uh, part one. This should be pretty straightforward uh, before I jump into um, some messy kernel stuff. I actually did have one question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, for, uh, yeah, for the tests. So the TAs are going to be releasing all the tests um, the two days before the deadline. So you can, I think the idea is like, from the spec, you can get things like 99% working in the level we so then you'll see if you need a new line or not. So they're writing the tests, so hopefully they won't be that fragile. But if they are, you'll know. Um, okay, so let's look at uh, the kernel intro now. Um, sometimes people use uh, the word kernel differently than the word OS. In this course, I'm just going to be using them as synonyms. Um, and for the intro, you're going to be adding a new system call to this nice little kernel called XV6. Um, so on my, like Linux, which is hundreds of thousands of lines or maybe even millions at this point, XV6 is under 10,000 lines of code. And uh, it was at one point, it was a real kernel that was used for things, and then it's imported to x86. And it's been kept simple. So now, now today it's mostly used for educational purposes. And it, it's pretty cool, right? Because if, it, if it's under 10,000 lines of code, if you wanted to spend some serious time on it, you could read the whole thing, and you could basically have an op operating system and everything it does in your head. So this simplicity really helps us uh, draft um, all the fundamental things that operating systems need to do. So um, we'll come back to this page, but let me just show you how to get up and running here. So I'm going to sign out of this. How many of you have used uh, SSH before? Okay, so most people. Um, so that's good. If you haven't used it, you should figure out how to use it because it'll help you um, work from home instead of having to come to the lab all the time. Um, one thing uh, that you might not have seen before is so I'm going to SSH into the Galapagos lab here. I have uh, on machine 12. Um, I'm going to add a dash X flag. And what that basically says is that the X11 windowing system, if I'm uh, running a program on the uh, lab machine and it has a GUI with it, that'll pop up on my laptop instead. So you want to sign in with that because um, you'll need that uh, to run um, the operating system. So it's a little bit slower now. And let me see. So if you come back here, you see that we put all the code in this file uh, right here. So some of the people um, who have already started this have been asking questions about, say, how to use tar or what that is. Uh, how many people have you have uh, used tar before? So okay, so most people. But um, if you don't like, there's all these uh, utilities and um, Unix that you want to familiarize yourself with, and it'll really help you uh, produce things per, um, efficiently uh, when you're working. So I'm going to copy this tar file here. Uh, to the local directory. Uh, does anybody know what tar stands for? Yeah, tape archive. Yeah, so it's a very it's a very old tool. So th it seems like things don't change as fast in the Unix world. Um, so okay, so I have my tar file here, and this just bundles a lot of small files together in one big file, and I want to um, kind of extract all those, kind of unzip them, and I'm going to do that with uh, tar, and I'm going to say extract x, and then I'm going to specify a file, and then do that. And that's pretty fast. And now I have all this code here in XV6. Okay. And there's a couple um, important directories that you should be aware of in here. Uh, first, all the operating system code is in this kernel directory. And then uh, when you run your operating system, there's going to be a lot of um, user space programs that you already have. Unfortunately, we don't have a compiler within the operating system. So to write a new program, you have to compile that before you run the operating system and have it already pre-installed. So all the pre-installed programs are uh, under this user directory. So 
what I usually imagine you're going to be doing is you're going to be cha making changes to the kernel and then writing a program um, under user that's going to do some tests for you. And that's what we're going to do when we're testing your code as well. So let's just run this guy right now. So we, it's pretty simple. We just run make kimu. Uh, so this is an emulator. And that compiles. And, and it's pretty fast. So now we're up and running. And you could type either in the black window, um, uh, which is kind of like the, why we had to do the dash x, or you could type over here. So if I, if I run ls, I see there's all these files. Um, all of these are the, the programs that were distributed with this. Um, so it's kind of a subset of what you might usually get on a Linux um, system. And I'm just going to uh, make a directory test, cd test, oops. So another thing you're going to notice is that because this is so simple, it, it lacks a lot of features like autocomplete, um, which is kind of annoying. Oh, I just did it again. Uh, and so now you notice that when I go into the directory and I run ls, it doesn't work anymore. That's because they don't even have environment variables set up where you kind of have um, programs that you can access from anywhere. So if I wanted to run that ls, I would have to say dot dot, go up a directory, and then I could actually uh, run that. So I'm going to close this out. And now let's actually make a program that's going to run uh, under user. So I'm going to switch under here. And in general, like there's a lot of code here, and it's pretty messy. So what I would suggest is that if you want to do something, find somebody else that's already working and copy that. And then you don't necessarily need to understand everything um, in order to be able to uh, make new features. So I'm going to just copy uh, the ls program to, we're going to make a hello world, I'm sorry. Um, so we have this here. And I'm going to delete all the code except for the main. Let's, let's call a system call, too, while we're at it, because I'm going to be talking a lot about that. So we'll say, my process ID is percent D. Oh, I get PID. Okay. And one thing that's a bit different about printf um, on here is that uh, you have to specify which file descriptor it goes to. So... So in a Unix environment, file descriptors are just used for input and output. They could go to files, or they could go to the terminal. So you could have input you're reading from the terminal. Um, or uh, say, oh, so zero is things that you're reading in. One is things you're just printing out normally. And then two are errors you're printing. So it's a little bit ugly, but you always have to have that um, in this environment. So now I'm going to um, do a make key move again. Oh, I need to go up a directory. Now if I run ls, I see, where is hello? Uh, oh, the hello's not here. I actually forgot to do something. So whenever you add, whenever you add a new program, you have to modify a make file. So let me, so under users, there's this file called makefile.make. And again, you don't even have to know what a make file is yet. You should learn what it is, but you don't need to know what it is to be able to do things. You can just say, well, I copied the ls program. So I'm going to copy, um, make a copy of that in the make file and add my hello. And let me run that again. Is hello there? What's it? Oh wait, where, where do you see it? Near the bottom. Oh, okay. It must not be sorted. Oh, I see. I thought it'd be alphabetic. Okay. Uh, so there's our first program. So now uh, you're going to be adding a new system call. And as you do that, what I recommend you do is that, well, here, I'll just show you what, what I recommend. Um, so I, I recommend you first find a very simple system call, say get PID. And then you should grep for that. So grep is just a search that searches through all text for references of this. And we can say recursive, so we want to look in all directories. And then I, because we don't want to get binary files, and then I want to search starting in this directory. So I run that, and I see these are all the places that you're going to have to be adding code yourself. Um, so you don't have to understand what all these different files are doing, but just like do um, what you normally do for a system call. So I'm going to be walking through a lot more details today uh, that are just informative, but you don't actually need to know all this for your project even. So let's first look at this uses file. Uh, 
This is where the system call is actually defined. So user um, usys s and so we, we have get PID here and this doesn't look like normal C code, right? This is uh, a macro. How many of you are pretty familiar with how the C preprocessor works? Okay, a handful of people. So basically what the C preprocessor does is it will read over your C code and look for special commands, say like this macro, and it will do things like find and replace on your code before uh, the C compiler even runs. So basically this snippet of code is getting written for each of these different system calls. Um, so this is pretty ugly here, and uh, I could walk you through that, but what I'm going to show instead is a good way to look at code that has a lot of ugly preprocessors in it. So if you run GCC, you can say just run the preprocessor without actually uh, compiling anything, and that would be a dash E dash P, and I can run on user usys dot S. Okay, and I can see kind of what this is translating to, but you actually see I got an error. Um, it can't find traps.h, um, and, and it didn't really convert a lot of things that it should have. So um, let me see where traps.h is so I can help it. So I run, I run find, and that just finds all the files everywhere. And then if I redirect that to grep, I can look for trap.h. Oh, what was it called? Uh, traps. Oh, OK. Oh, I see it. OK, so I see that's in the include directory. So let me go back to my GCC command, and what I can do is I can say, when you're looking for H files, you should uh, look in this other directory that I know about. So I'm going to say that's an include, and I run that again. Uh, where am I now? Okay, and now this is uh, actually a little bit different. Did people see the difference? Let me. So you see that there's actually numbers in this one, whereas before it was uh, not really completing these macros. But now where it actually finds the H files, it has all these things. Um, so you see that this is actually pretty similar uh, to what we had um, in class yesterday when I was showing you how to call a system call uh, from assembly. So first, uh, the numbers are slightly different, like 64, that uh, is the interrupt for all system calls. And then each of these different numbers um, represent which system call we want. So let me see if I can actually find, uh, uh, get PID. So yeah, we can see that uh, the get PID, that's system call 18. And then, well, of course, we say 64 because it's a system call. So uh, what, what I'd like to show you today is how um, those numbers get passed around through the operating system so it actually ends up executing the proper call. So first, let me show you what the proper call actually is. This is under sysproc. And so here it is. It's just a very simple system call. So we want to see. Um, how this ultimately gets called. So how, how many of you are pretty familiar with uh, GDB? Do you use it a lot? Um, so just a handful of people. So I think uh, using GDB uh, will uh, be pretty useful. I don't use it as much as some people do. Some people will set up all kinds of like breakpoints and uh, print all kinds of things from that. Usually all I use GDB for is just to print off a stack trace when something seg faults. And I do most of my debugging uh, the old fashioned way with just having a bunch of printfs everywhere. But here what we're going to do you're laughing at me. Uh, so here, here what we're going to do is we're going to um, use GDB not to fix a bug, but to actually understand uh, how the code works. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set it up so that when this, uh, this system call gets called, I'm going to stop and print off what the stack trace is so I can see all the different um, functions that are involved in this. So to do that, uh, I can run make kimu and then GDB. Okay, and now we see it started booting, but then it got stuck here um, for a moment, and it, it's telling us right here, now you have to run uh, GDB from another terminal. Uh, so let me see if I can find that. Uh, so I'm going to SSH then, and go back to scratch. So basically what that other, um, when I ran the other command did, is it created this gdb init file. And I can just cat that out. I don't understand all the details of it, but uh, basically what it's doing is it's describing how gdb can connect to the OS uh, while it's running. So if I run gdb from this directory, 
it will just automatically pick that up. And now it is um, connected uh, with my running operating system and I can start debugging it. Uh, so if, if uh, you try to do this, like on some machines, there's different security settings where it won't let you just read in any old GDB and net file. Uh, but you can Google and figure out how to disable the security settings um, so that uh, life is easier for you. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to set a breakpoint, so that's B. And I'm going to say whenever that system call gets called, I want to stop running. So I do that. And now I can give the operating system permission to finish running. So I say that with continue or C. And now the operating system is up and running and everything's good. And so now I'm going to run hello. And when we run this, this is calling the get process ID uh, system call. So we should expect everything to freeze up again and we'll go back to GDB. So that's what happens. And now we're over here in GDB. And we see that we stopped in sysproc on line 40 which makes sense, that's where the, the, where the function is that we were looking at. And I can run backtrace, bt, and that shows all the different functions that were involved in calling that. So at the very bottom, we have uh, some garbage, and that's because uh, GDB is looking for different stack frames to try to figure out what all the different functions were, and we have some assembly code that doesn't really conform to what GDB expects. But starting in trap ASM, we can get all the lines um, all the way down uh, to the actual call. So uh, we already looked at this here. Well, I'm going to go back to that quick. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to kill this and go back to sysproc. I think that was line 40. Okay, so we were here. And then so the next thing up uh, above that, uh, this was called by syscall.c uh, on line 177. So I'm going to jump over there. Or what was it, 117? Yeah, here it is. Okay, so we see that somehow this line of code managed to call uh, uh, sys get PID. So wh what's going on? I mean, this might be some uh, confusing depending on uh, your background in C, but I'm going to look for where this sys calls thing is defined, and, and I see this messy piece of C. So what... Uh, what exactly is, how would you describe this, um, this instance of a data structure here? What is this? Yeah, exactly, it's a function pointer array. Uh, very good. So let me, let me just like refresh your guys' memory of what a function pointer looks like. A function pointer just looks like this, where, so we have the name of uh, the function pointer inside the parentheses with a star in front of it, and then we have the arguments, uh, oops, let me get rid of this. We have the arguments after it, and then we have the return value in front of it. So this is a single uh, function pointer. So yeah, a, a function pointer array looks just like that. And that's what we have uh, right here. So what, what about all this stuff inside it? Uh, do people, does anybody know what this all is? So what, 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 what would it be if I had something like this? What would this code be doing? Actually, let me change those numbers. So what, what does this code do for the first few lines? Um, so basically, what, what this does is, so when I have the curly brackets, I'm creating a new array, and I'm initializing the first item is 0, the second item is 2, and the third item is 1. Um, this works slightly different. So within these brackets, these are integers. So let me see where my get PID is. So I think we saw that get PID was 18. So this is saying the 18th element in this array should be sys get PID. Well, that's the function we were looking at. So we're saying the 18th element of this array should be pointing to the implementation of our system call. Um, so that's how it actually gets down. Uh, so let me, uh, let me close this now. Yes, and so so you remember here. So this is 18. So that's that's how uh, that's where the 18 actually gets represented. We call the proper system call. So where does the 64 actually? How does that channel us to the right code? Um, so let me go back to our stack trace. So we've we've just looked at this sysproc.c and syscall.c. So now let's start looking higher up the stack.
So we got called uh, right from here. So we see that there's all these traps. And uh, basically, if the trap number is a system call, uh, then we're calling that syscall function we uh, just looked at. So um, that makes sense. There's other kind of traps, say like a, a timer event, um, or, or say like a keyboard event. Uh, and each of those is going to do a different thing. So each of these is a different interrupt. Um, one thing I should clarify is I think uh, in 354, did they distinguish between traps and interrupts? I think they have uh, used a certain terminology. Um, here, here I'm just using those terms interchangeably uh, because that's what this code base does. Basically, ba basically both are, are any case where kind of either uh, a program or a device interrupts the operating system and has the operating system start running some code. So how do we get to this point? Well, we see that we came from this, uh, uh, some assembly code in trap ASM. So I'm going to open up that. And what line was that? That was on line uh, 25. Um, so this gets called by that. And if I read up through this, it says, oh, vectors.s sends all traps here. And that's, that's kind of where this uh, stack trace fell off, right? Uh, the the vectors.s does some weird stuff, so we couldn't see that in GDB. But uh, now this comment tells us how uh, what the next thing up in the stack is. So if we look in vectors.s, um, we see this strange code, which was actually automatically generated. And, and basically, each time, it's jumping to all traps. And it's just pushing um, which uh, the, the number of the interrupt there. So uh, to understand like how this actually gets used, um, you'd have to like search through the code some uh, for a while looking for things called vectors. Um, I've already done that, so I'm just going to jump right there. And this is back in trap.c. So where do we use these vectors? So basically, each of these vectors is like a little snippet of code, right? It's jumping somewhere, so it's like a little function. Um, and these uh, get used in this uh, init function. And basically, I'm not going to look at this macro now, but it's basically populating this IDT table. So this is the descriptor table. Basically, everything in the descriptor table it's uh, making me, making each element point to the corresponding vector, okay? And we also have like the system call here. So then, when the operating system is loading, we have all these um, we have all these interrupt descriptors, and we call lidt, and that's just a wrapper around an x86 instruction, and it actually tells the CPU here's where my interrupt descriptor table is. And so then, when the CPU uh, gets an interrupt and it knows it's interrupt 64. Uh, it looks in those vectors and it gets the function pointer there, and then it ultimately um, will end up jumping um, to trap and it'll pass the appropriate argument. So, um, I mean, that's most of what I have for today. Do people have questions? I guess other, other things to talk about is. Um, uh, how many of you use uh, good, like, have a good text editor from your coding? I feel like that will make a big difference on how quickly you get projects done. So, like, say, who, who uses Emacs? So, a handful. I, I, it would be good if, like, there was more people that learned it. What about, uh, say, like, VI? Oh, well, it's well, so, like a lot of people have a decent editor then. So, if, if, you, if you don't use those and say, like, you're just using, uh, like, Notepad or something, I would highly recommend you learn a sophisticated editor because as you're jumping around a lot of code, like, you kind of want to be nimble, be able to search quickly. And it'll really make it easier to understand your code base and uh, be able to work work efficiently. So, um, I guess again, uh, any questions? I guess we're done early today, otherwise. So, all right. Thank you.